So we're on day three of the five day fasting challenge and many of you guys broke fast yesterday to end your first nomad. First, congratulations on making it that far. Second, I'd like to let you know that I'll be fasting from solid food until Friday. So I'm sort of right there along with you. My experience may be a little bit different, but I'm gonna catch up with you, learn more about how you're doing and uh, so on and so forth later on today uh, during my live stream at 1 p.m when I'll be doing my workout, so I'll talk to you guys then. The purpose of this video today is to offer you some support in an area that was of great value to me when I started fasting back in November of last year. So I know that I had been called to fast, both spiritually and physically. Physically, I was getting fat. Spiritually, there was an inner calling and uh, the still small voice within, they say, was just urging me and prompting me to stop consuming, stop eating. So like most people, uh, if I'm going to embark on a new sort of journey, I want to prepare myself and arm myself with as much information and inspiration as possible. So as far as information is concerned, I started devouring all the brand new books and videos that are out about the benefits of fasting. It's interesting that only the past five years or so uh, has science sort of caught up with the ancient practice of fasting and now can show us all of the physical benefits through blood tests and so on and so forth. And if you dig into it, by reading some of the books I suggested in a previous video, including the work of Dr. Jason Fung, Dr. Mercola, uh, watching some of the videos by Sim Land on YouTube, as well as uh, the Snake Diet Wizard, Cole Robinson. They're all great sources of information, uh, particularly the, the doctors I mentioned. Because when you read these books or you watch these videos, the ego is validated. And I know that my ego likes validation. If I'm going to do something, but I have uh, scientific, rational, uh, study-supported information, it's just going to give me a little bit more impetus to keep going, right? Well, as much information as I was able to consume about the scientific benefits and the physiological and health and biological benefits of fasting, I knew that that was only half of the equation. Like I mentioned, I was called through body and I was called through soul. And so during my prolonged fasting season where I was doing multiple stints of three day, five day and 10 day fast, I also wanted to support my soul with scripture and with religious spiritual ideas. And I had been interested in religion and spirituality for huh, probably since I was in high school. And a lot of what I studied and learned were Eastern philosophies. You know, I grew up in a Judeo-Christian society. Uh, I have always had an interest in Abrahamic religions, but it was really the Taoists and the Buddhists and the Hindus that opened my mind to see God and religion in a brand new way. And so I had spent many years reading the Tao Te Chung and studying you know, books of that sort. But this was something new this year, something new in me. And I wanted something to support me spiritually that was uniquely Western. As opposed to Eastern philosophy and Eastern religion, in the West we've got our Abrahamic religions. And in particular, we've got Christianity. Now, we know that Islam is an Abrahamic religion and uh, Muslims fast and they read the Quran and uh, I'm sure there's all kinds of great information about fasting and inspiration about fasting uh, in the Quran, so much so that Muslim people stay disciplined and steadfast and committed to their fasting practice year after year by fasting during the month of Ramadan. Well, where is that for Western Christians. And while I was doing some digging and trying to find out where I can get that type of unique support, I came across the idea of asceticism. Asceticism is a sort of 
uh, self-imposed discipline, choosing the harsh life, the hard life, the committed, steadfast, detached, stoic, strong life of an ascetic, all for the means of expanding their consciousness. So it's physical austerities for metaphysical expansion, growth, spiritual, spirituality. And through, through the exploration of ascetics, this idea of discipline for spirituality, I was led to the early first church, the Orthodox church that were led by the patriarchs, they call them. These are the fathers of the first church. And it came, uh, what I discovered was that fasting is heavily embedded in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, where Jesus admonishes or, or scolds his students for not fasting. And he uses himself as an example by fasting for 40 freaking days. There's a lot to be said for uh, fasting in the West, although we have been tricked, in my opinion, and, uh, and led astray from our spiritual roots that lie deep within the body. To get to the above, we must sink down below. And it's about tapping into the magic of fasting. So today I'd like to introduce you to a book that was of uh, tremendous value to me. It's a small book and it uh, puts to, it's sort of a compilation of some of the writings of the early fathers of the Orthodox Church. The patriarchs, they call them. Uh, and this, this book by the author Tito Campbell, The Way of Aesthetics, or Coleander, Tito Coleander, The Way of Aesthetics, is uh, is is short, it's sweet, and it has little passages that I would read every single day, particularly during my 10-day fast. And so I figure today, uh, while we're right in the middle, exactly, of our five-day fasting challenge, that it may be helpful to you to hear a little bit about what the patriarchs, the fathers of the early church, had to say about ascetics, asceticism, and in particular, fasting. So if you'll bear with me and if this type of content is of interest to you, stick around and I'm going to share a little bit from this book and maybe we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we're learning here. So in chapter 20, chapter titled On Fasting, the author goes on. He says, fasting neither above nor below your ability will help you in your vigil, your efforts. One should not ponder divine matters on a full stomach, say the ascetics. For the well-fed, even the most super, superficial secrets of the Trinity lie hidden. Christ himself set the example with his long fast. When he drove out the devil, he had fasted for 40 days. Are we better than he? Behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Matthew 4.11. They are waiting to minister unto you too. So that's the first paragraph. I want to stop there right for a moment because uh, he makes a, a pretty bold statement here. He says, one should not ponder divine matters on a full stomach, says the ascetics. You know, the fathers and the practices of asceticism uh, in the early church. Ponder divine matters. Now, Pondering divine matters goes way beyond just uh, reading the Bible or reading spiritual scripture or deliberating with friends or your priest or your pastor about, you know, uh, particular ideas that are associated with religion. I also see pondering divine matters as a, uh, a way to describe looking for your purpose in life. How many young men? How many young men are out there that are still looking for their purpose in life, looking for your purpose? What is your mission? What are you here for? Why are you doing this? What does it all mean? Those are deep, meaningful, religious, spiritual, divine questions to ponder. 
And I know that they're there in your heart. I know that you ask those questions because you send your questions to me. And a part of the reason why I stopped answering those questions is because I realized that it was irresponsible for me to give you what you need to go get on your own. But how do you go get that? Well, he says here that for the well-fed, that means people who eat all day, every day, three times a day, 365 days a year, never fast for the well-fed, even the most superficial secrets are hidden from him. So even the most basic things like what to do today, should I date this girl or not? What should I eat today if I choose to eat? All these things that oftentimes seem perplexing and confusing and we get caught up in a tizzy and don't know what to do. It's because you're stuffed or stuffed or well fed. Goes on to say that Christ himself sets the example with his long fast, 40 days. You know, it's interesting how many Christians love to quote scripture and talk about Jesus and you know, all the things that Christians do, but very rarely do they ever bring up the fact that Jesus was a practitioner. Jesus was mystical, magical, divine, a man on earth and all those things, but he was a practitioner. He practiced, he didn't just preach. And a part of that practice was fasting. And it wasn't just sort of a OMAD fasting, right? 18.6 or something like that. It wasn't a casual relationship with fasting, though there's something to be said with that, and I'll talk more about that later. He was an extremist and took extreme measures to clear himself free so that he can be led by the divine. 40 days, we're doing five. And you know, the author goes on and says, are we better than him? Really good question. Are we better than him? So Jesus is so humble that he needs to fast for 40 days in order to be led by the divine and to fight the demons. I spoke to you about it in an earlier video where I refer to demons as, you know, those, that, that negative chatter in your ears and in your heart. It's there. The demons are there. Whether you call them demons or you call, call them automatic negative thoughts, they're there. And if Jesus, son of man, needs to fast 40 days to battle those demons and to purify himself so that he can be led by the divine, then you can take a day at a time here with our easy five-day fast. Let's continue. Fasting tempers loquacity, which is a word I don't understand, but it's I believe it's like arrogance. So fasting tempers arrogance. I'm going to go ahead and change it. it says St. John Climactus. It is an outlet for compassion and a guard upon obedience. It destroys evil thoughts and roots out the insensibility of the heart. It roots out the insensibility of the heart. I like that word root out because when, if you got to root something out, that means you got to dig deep to go get it. Fasting is a gate to paradise. When the stomach is constricted, the heart is humbled. He who fasts and prays with a sober mind, but the mind of the intemperate person is filled with impure fancies and thoughts. Let's go over that for a moment, if we will. So fasting tempers audacity uh, and this sense of pride. Uh, and it's an outlet, and think about an outlet. For something to be let out, there needs to be an opening. It's an outlet. Fasting is an opening for the outlet of compassion, right? There's no outlet without an opening. You open to compassion. How many fake compassion practitioners are there out there who do things against their, their will to look compassionate? Well, when there's an opening, Compassion just flows out. There's an outlet for it. And a guard upon obedience. So that word obedience, of course, is a loaded word. 
and a word that we we cringe about in the West. Right? We've been taught to hate authority, to hate obedience, and anything of that nature, which I think is a we lose a lot because of that, because we lose discipline, we lose meaning. But he goes on, he says that fasting is a guard upon obedience. And so I would like to offer you this, that maybe the obedience isn't necessarily to a set of scriptures or religious dogma, but it's obedience to that still small voice within that you can finally hear because you're clean due to your fasting. You're not clogged with food. You're not weighed down. You're not foggy. And so the obedience would be to that of your higher calling, your sense of self, your purpose, or God speaking through you. And it becomes that much easier because he goes on, he says that it destroys evil thoughts, destroys, bang, obliterates evil thoughts, evil thoughts. If you ever take the time in a day and carry around a notebook and just Jot down every negative self-talk that you have all day long. Negative self-talk, negative or uh, judgmental sentiments of other people, judging other people. Uh, the sensibility of anger, jealousy, resentment, hate. These things are constantly bombarding us. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm constantly dealing with these demons. All kinds of demons, arrogance, pride, like I said before. So these evil thoughts are destroyed through fasting. And look, I know this is true. All of this is true because I practice, because I've experienced. And the only way that you're going to know that the mind and all of its mental chatter and that monkey sitting on your shoulder is going to shut his muzzle is by the practice of fasting. And that's why I'm happy you're here with me today. So it destroys evil thoughts and roots out the insensibility of the heart. So if you think about thoughts are up here and it destroys, it's easy to destroy thoughts because thoughts are still in the spiritual realm. They're still, they're still very intangible, you know, spirit, mind, uh, emotion, body, boom. So it's still kind of up here somewhere. So fasting will slow down the mind so that the evil thoughts, they have nowhere to go. They have nothing to grab onto. They just go. They'll just go. But I like this, where he goes on to say that it also roots out. Think about the mind and then think about the heart, what's needed to get into the heart. You've got to root it out because a lot of it's unconscious, emotional. And so it needs to be rooted out. And I like the way he puts it here. It roots out the insensibility of the heart. So basically the, the, the stupidness of the heart, the hardness of the heart. When we fast, Again, this is all based on my experience and what I gather. The emotions come to the surface. All of a sudden, all of that latent under, you know, they show the, the iceberg and underneath the water. They say that like 90% of what's happening is under the water. Only about 10% is up. So the heart is all about under the water. It's all about the emotion. It's all about what you can't see, but it's there and it's guiding you. And when you fast, because the mind begins to slow down in some instances, especially if you're doing like 10, 20, 40 days, uh, the heart, all of what was bubbling up underneath comes to the surface in all kinds of irrational emotions. Uh, during my fasting season earlier this year and late last year, I confronted a lot of old trauma and anger and jealousy that was completely irrational but latent within me. And I really had to confront my inner beta, those inner weaknesses of the heart that wouldn't have shown themselves if I was constantly stuffing my face and numbing myself with food. This is only available when we shut down and we cleanse out. And then all the junk, the demons, and the hardnesses of heart rise to the surface so they, they can be dealt with. And I want to just draw to your attention that this is normal. This is natural. Jesus fought with the devil in the desert. You see? So, Jesus, to Christians, the perfect example of a man, how to be a true alpha male. Uh, he's dealing with this shit. If you don't think you're going to deal with some sort of emotional, mental, 
negativity, negative self-talk about why you can't do this, and emotions. Emotions is what makes you think you need food or you're going to die. Uh, for me, especially when I started getting into longer days of fasting, I began to notice a sense of pride and arrogance that was coming over me because I was fasting. And I'd look at the other people around me. <laughs> I, you know, this is, this is latent beta shit deep within Yo Elliot. Yeah, and I get to deal with it, I get to face it, and I get to root it out! And so I'd be fasting, fasting multiple days, and I'm like, you know, looking at people around me eating slobs. I'm thinking to myself, look at them, they have no control over their set themselves. I'm over here. I fasted for seven days. I'm fasting. I can control myself. I have self-control, but they're weak. Look at them. Nasty. So that's like, <laughs> that's the devil. That's demons. That's insensitivities of the heart rising to the surface. They're in the middle of a fast that I got to look at, be quiet about, and allow to pass. That's the other thing. Once, it's, once those thoughts are destroyed and that evil is rooted out, you don't need to do anything anymore because attention or awareness, I'm sorry, is transformative in and of itself. So it can just go away. Go away. Get out of here. That's silly. And I would look at some of the feelings I was having and I realized just how silly they were, but I didn't know they were there until I began fasting. So all very, all very helpful to you, I, I would hope. Uh, he who fasts, let's go on. He who fasts prays. You know, prayer can prayer is not necessarily uh, you know what you repeat from what you've heard. Prayer is communion. Prayer is coming in contact with and praising, uh, or appreciating, or merely being in silent communion with. And he says that when you when you fast, he who fast he he who prays prays with a sober mind. Opposite of sober is drunk, drunk with carbs, drunk with meat, drunk with junk food. But he says, you get a sober mind. But the mind of the intemperate person, a person who does not temper his emotions, just does what he thinks he should do, just do, follows his thoughts and follows his emotion, right? Where we just spoke about, the devil hangs out. Uh, is filled with impure fancies and thoughts. I think that's beautiful because fancies, think about the word fancy. They're always beautiful. Something is fancy is nice. Impure fancies, meaning they're not really from you. It's interesting that when we are not deeply in touch, sober, connected with self and God, that a lot of the, the quote unquote good ideas or the things that come and, inspire, and, and quote unquote inspire us, you know, you're flipping through Instagram and you see somebody with a Lamborghini and then it's like, whoa, that's some fancy shit right there. I want it. Uh, you're going to be filled with all that kind of shit. But when you fast, because there's an objectivity that's associated with fasting, you sort of are able to create space between yourself and the world. Uh, in other words, Stephen Covey puts it this way, uh, be between stimulus you know, seeing something, hearing something, touching something. And response, there's a space. And in that space, you choose how you're going to, your, your whole life is found in that space. Because we're constantly getting stimulus, but that response is either automatic or there's, no, or there's a space. If it's automatic, you're living on autopilot, you're, you're, you're a zombie. You're living life without thought. There's a stimulus, and then you just go. But when you fast, that gap that Stephen Covey's talking about spreads. It gets bigger and bigger. So there's a stimulus and boom. It's, not, it's like you transcend time. It's not even like you take your time. It's like time stops because you come home. And it gives you a better opportunity. It gives you an opportunity to make better, thought, better, better choices about the thoughts that are coming to you. Fancies. Fasting is an expression of love and devotion in which one sacrifices earthly satisfaction to attain the heavenly. You give up what's lower for what's higher. You give up some muscle mass for some character development. Although too much of one's thoughts, uh, I'm sorry, altogether too much of one's thoughts are taken up with care for sustenance and the enticements of the palate. One wishes to be free from that. 
you know, we're, we're constantly thinking about enticements and, uh, and uh, sustenance. Just think about it. If you, when you stop eating, notice how often the people around you or even yourself begin thinking about what I should be eating right now, what I would like to eat right now. The thought is so uh, pervasive and so insidious that it creeps up. And if you wish to be free from it, well, fasting. Thus, fasting is a step on the road of emancipation and an indispensable support in the struggle against selfish desires. Together with prayer, fasting was one of humanity's greatest gifts, carefully cherished by those who have participated in it. And I'm telling you, the more you fast, the more you cherish. Cherish fasting. During fasting, thankfulness grows towards him who has given humanity the possibility of fasting. Fasting opens the entrance to a territory that you have scarcely glimpsed. I mean, think about it. Scarcely glimpsed because you're always eating. The expression of life and all the events around you and within you get a new illumination. The hastening hours anew, wide-eyed and rich purpose. So I mentioned earlier about uh, knowing your purpose, knowing your mission, knowing yourself. Well, he says right here. Through fasting, you get a new illumination. Illumination means light, awareness. The hastening hours are anew. That means everything around you and all you're experiencing is new. It's from a new veneer. You're wearing new lenses when you fast. Just notice. Notice how you think differently. You begin to see things differently. And he calls it wide-eyed and rich purpose. Well, there you have it. Your purpose. The vigil of groping thought. Ugh, needy. Think about groping. Needy. I want those titties. I want that cookie. You see all that? The vigil of groping thoughts is replaced by a vigil of clarity. I don't need those titties. I don't need those cookies. Troublesome searching is changed to quiet accept acceptance and gratitude and humility. Troublesome searching, how many of you are in troublesome searching? Is changed to quiet acceptance. What a beautiful, beautiful way to be. Ingratitude and humility. And, and it's taken me like the past five years to understand the, the, the value in that type of stillness and quiet. And how when I'm not groping and when I'm not trying to overthink or I'm not trying to achieve, that I'm simply led to the pot of gold quiet stillness is where true action comes from everything else is activity and activity is born of fear seemingly large complex problems open their center like the ripe buds of a flower think about that all your perplexing problems with prayer fasting and vigil in union we may knock on the door we wish to see opened we here find the reason that fasting is often used as a measuring stick by the Holy Fathers. He who fasts much is he who loves much, and he who has loved much is forgiven. He who fasts much also receives much. And I'll stop there. So I hope today, during the third day of the five-day fasting challenge, that this video and my book recommendation and some of the inspiration associated with spiritual fasting will carry you through to the end. Let me know if you enjoyed this video. Uh, also, I have a free ebook that you can get down below, the Five Day Fasting Challenge. Forgot to mention that earlier. Read that, prepare yourself, get involved with fasting, watch the past few videos that I've made on this channel for the, the five videos for the Five Day Fasting Challenge. Really excited to continue on this journey with you guys. Love to hear more about your experiences. I'd love to get some feedback from you. And I'd love to talk to you during our live stream later on today when I'll be working out in my garage. Done. <laughs>